All right. Hello, everybody. Um, make sure Janet works. Are you there, Janet? Is your microphone on? Uh-oh, I can't hear you. It's on? Mm-mm. Try um, closing your tab real quick and then coming back to the same link. Here. I'm going to panic. Just a second. I'm going to try to set us up in a new room. Oh. See if that works. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome. We get in Janet's audio work in. This happens from time to time. As you guys know, those of you who have been to a few of these, um, this is the world we live in now. So welcome to um, another edition of FFT Insider. Uh, we're going to be talking to a uh, four-time Olympic gold medalist, Janet Evans. Let's see if Janet works now. Okay, wait. Hey, Hello. That happens. Can you hear me now? Yeah. The last thing I heard was, I'm going to panic, and then I went off. <laughs> no, but I have a panic button I can hit that just, like, completely resets everything. But usually if you just, like, exit out and come back in, it works. And sometimes, I don't know why that happens, but I'm glad we fixed it. <laughs> I'm not very good with technology, so. Well, I mean, it's not you, absolutely. It's just the world we live in right now. So um, I'd like to introduce our guest this week on um, Fitter and Faster Live. Uh, Janet is a good personal friend of mine. I've known her for a very long time. Um, she's a legend in the sport. She won four individual Olympic gold medals, one silver medal. She won 19 international titles, 45, 45 U.S. national titles, and broke seven world records, and um, many of which stood for two decades. I think your one of your records was at the 800 freestyle, stood for, um, it's the second longest record ever in swimming, besides, I think, the one that stood, like, back in the 30s or something, so. I think yeah. so. It felt like a long time ago. <laughs> So yeah. So, so awesome. Yeah. I'm so excited to have you here. I've looked up to you my whole life and now looking up to you as a mother with me being a mom to be, um, so excited to be able to talk to you today. So how are you? Where are you? How's it going? How's your quarantine? Good. Our quarantine is going well. We're in Southern California. Um, so I'm doing this outside in my courtyard this morning because the weather is beautiful. Uh, but we're, I think the biggest challenge as many parents that I'm are probably on, would say is the homeschooling and not my seventh grader, but my fourth grader who is a boy. So that's been relatively interesting, but we're, we're, uh, we're playing. <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, guys, today I'm planning on kind of breaking today's conversation down into four little sections. I want to talk to Janet about, um, you know, all of this is kind of in the mindset of, you know, both Janet and I are distance freestylers. Um, I want to talk about training and then racing, mostly like mindset, um, but along with the physical aspects of it, you know, kind of what it takes to train and race as a distance swimmer, as an elite swimmer. Um, and then lifestyle, just kind of things outside of the water um, and kind of some fun questions. And then at the very end, we'll open it up for Q&A. So honestly, I'm not going to be looking at the chat too much um, until the very end. I'll keep an eye on it and I'll moderate it. As you guys know, those of you who have done a few of these, um, if anybody's spamming or trolling or just being inappropriate, I'll kick you out of the room. It's nothing personal. You know I love you. Um, but I want to keep that chat relevant and um, keep it flowing. So um, just make sure that you guys are, are being responsible over there with that. Um, I'll throw up a few polls as we go along, too, for some interaction. And like I said, save your questions till the end. So, um, so Janet, uh, tell me about how you began swimming. Let's start from the very beginning. Oh, my gosh. Well, Chloe, it was so long ago. But... Um... I grew up here in Southern California and my mom can't swim. My mom was born and raised in uh, a little town in Texas called Waco where there's not a lot of water. And uh, my parents moved out to Southern California, bought a home with a pool in the backyard. And uh, my mom put my two older brothers and I in swim lessons. So um, I was a tiny little skinny girl, um, you know, kind of was always very competitive and a little bit scrappy. I have two older brothers. Um, and when the 84 Olympics came to Los Angeles, we went to the opening ceremonies in, in 84, a long time ago. And uh, I watched the opening ceremonies and, and I was a good age group swimmer at that time, um, but realized that I wanted to um, swim in the Olympics in, in four years in 1988 and went back and told my coach. And um, we talked about goal setting and, and sacrifices and instant gratification versus future rewards. And uh kind of put the plan into motion. And, and four years later, I made my first team. Amazing. And my mom still, and my mom still can't swim. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, can years later. Yeah. yeah. 
He doesn't want to get I, I would say, I don't know if I've ever even seen my mom's hair really wet. Yeah, yes. she won't let anybody see her that way. <laughs> mine neither. She's a good Texan, so mine yes. neither. <laughs> so when did you begin to specialize in distance freestyle? Did you kind of always lean towards freestyle and the longer races, or is that something you kind of discovered later on? I think I always lean towards the longer races. You know, I think I like to say that I didn't find distance swimming, that distance swimming found me. Um, I, uh, you know, when I was 10 and under, I was always best at the 200 free, right? And so, you know, whenever a longer freestyle race became, you know, was available, I would swim it and I'd always do a little bit better. Um, I, you know, for me, when I tried to sprint, uh, you know, my tempo, my tempo was so high during my distance races that my my sprinting tempo wasn't very much different because I just don't know how much faster my arms could have gone. And I tended to spin. I tried to sprint and I just didn't get that distance per stroke. And so, um, you know, I, I truly was made, you know, with like you with endurance to continue going my my VO2 max, my lung capacity, you know, but also I was an I -er. you know, it's funny, my daughter swims and years ago we got in the pool together years ago she was like seven or eight and i swam some butterfly and she said you know how to swim butterfly <laughs> i you know i think people tend to to forget that I, I i my first gold medal was in the 400 im at the Seoul games um and you know my training i trained a lot of im um and and my strokes weren't bad you know i could hold my own in a you know fly was my worst but i could hold my own in a two back and a two breast at you know at a national type meet um you know, and, and my coach has always made me swim those races um, as practice for my 4IM. And even when I, I missed the 92 team in 4IM, I didn't train for the 4IM. And I didn't swim the 4IM in 96, but I trained IM through my entire career. I don't know if you trained a lot of IM, but I found it to be very helpful with my freestyle as well. Yeah, I think mostly I trained IM and raced IM for a little break from just freestyle all the time. Yeah. Um, if I was having a rough day, my coach would be just tell me to go over in the IM lane or just finish the rest of the set butterfly. And I'm like, Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, butterfly, of course, right? my favorite. yeah. Um, but I did, I swam the 400 IM and the 200 fly pretty much at every, yeah. I'm not sure if I had trials cuts, but, but I specialized in that as well. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think, yeah, like you said, it's, it's, uh, I think it's good for freestylers to train at least the other strokes if not also compete them. Um, even though both Jan and I specialized in distance freestyle, obviously, um, you know, it's very healthy and very, I think, important to diversify your training in that way. I agree. And, you know, I think 400 IMers are in the same vein as us. I mean, personally, I think I always thought the 400 IM was a harder race than the mile. Like I, my body hurt more the next day after two 400 IMs than it did after yeah. a mile. Um, I think because you're just using so many different muscle groups. So, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Did you have an age group where you began to really break out or did it, was it just kind of a slow rise? It was a little bit of a slow rise. I, you know, it's funny. My daughter was asking me the other day, I, I held a national age group record in the two free when I was 10. Um, and then like when I was 11, 12, 13, 14, I was, you know, if you looked at national rankings and literally Chloe, it was so long, so long, ago. <laughs> but you know, I, I wasn't like, this absolute phenom, right? I was, I was, I clearly held a national age group record, but I wasn't like, you know why I know this is because my daughter was looking at the top hundred times for Southern California or for the United yeah. States U S swimming. Yeah. And, and I'm on it as like a 13 year old, but I'm like deep in the 400, like 26. And look, I do not look at this stuff. Truly. My daughter was on it last week. So, um, cause she's still supported free and she wanted to know. And so, um, so I was like 26 all time, 13, 14, 400 freestyle. Um, so yeah, so I wasn't like breaking national age group records at 13. I was kind of somewhere, I was good, clearly. Um, but you know, I kind of had my breakout uh, the summer of 86 when I was 14. After okay. my year of high school and I um, made the June, the B team, the A team went to world champs in Madrid and the B team went to the Goodwill Games in Moscow. I got third at uh, world champ trials in I don't remember, but I made the team in the four free and the eight free and the four I am. Um, and so that was really my breakout year. And it wasn't like I came out of nowhere, but I do mm -hmm. think that um, girls, especially, um, you know, if you look at, and I might be wrong, but I would say Katie Ledecky might've been the same way. Like all of a sudden she just broke out. Right. And so, you know, while sometimes you have swimmers like Michael Phelps who are like great the whole time, I, I, I see, especially with girls, sometimes they just have its breakout year and then they're, 
they're yeah. unstoppable. And that's kind of what really what happened to me as well. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I grew or something. I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but it's like all these times just dropped and all of a sudden it was there. Yeah. Well, speaking yeah. of growing, um, is that something, cause you're, you're shorter than the typical <laughs> Olympic swimmer. Yeah. I'm yeah. shorter than the typical Olympic swimmer and you're shorter than me. How tall are you? So I, I measured myself the other night against my daughter. I'm five, five. Okay. Yeah. So, um, five, five. so when you're growing up, I, I do think I've shrunk in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> I think I used to be closer to five, six. Don't, I'm almost 50. So I think you start, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I'm five, five. I think at my first Olympics, I was like five, three and a half. I, I, really matured and grew a lot after my first Olympics, you know, my last year of high school when I got to college. Yeah. Um, but at my first Olympics, I weighed 99 pounds. Oh, wow. Is yeah. that something you ever thought about? Did you ever think about like, oh man, I'm shorter than all these yeah, other guys? Yeah, totally. And, and don't forget, I mean, you were, you know, you're too young, but I was swimming against East Germans and they were right. like 5'11". And some of them are my very good friends now. So, but they were, and they will laugh because they were big, strong, tall girls. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a great story. I, my first nationals was the summer of 85 and it was at Mission Viejo um, where you used to train. And it was, so it was a year after the 84 games. So I go to nationals and I'm, I'm 13 years old and I'm literally, um, and time, I think the time standards were easier than I'm just telling you. Um, but so that's why I was at nationals, but, um, I was probably like five, one or five, two, I was 13. I probably weighed 90, 90 to 95 pounds. And there was a woman there named Tiffany Cohen and Tiffany Cohen won the, uh, 400 and 800 freestyle at the LA games in 1984. And I love her. She's a friend, but she didn't know me then. And she saw me and she laughed at me. She laughed at me. And I remember thinking like, well, just wait, just you wait, like you wait, I might be little, but I am mighty. And I will beat you one day. And I did. And so it was kind of like that might makes right philosophy. Um, I kind of knew what I was capable of. I knew that I trained like an animal. I knew that I could put my mind to anything I wanted to do. And if there was one thing I was, it was confident. And I personally never let my size bother me. And I talk to parents about it a lot. You know, I get a lot of of communication from parents who say their child is small and can they, you know, what do they do? And, you know, my, and you, you were small too. So I, you know, you compared to the big five eleven girls. So, you know, to me, size is in your mind and size is what you make of it. Um, and, uh, training, training trumps everything in my mind. And so I just, I, to me, I had a little disadvantage on the walls <laughs> and the start, but gosh darn it, I trained to make up for that. And um, I think it was my mindset that allowed me to really uh, believe in myself regardless of my size. Mm -hmm. And and if people laughed at me and people that told me I was too small, um, you know, it is what it is, you mm -hmm. know? And and I think that as, as I look back on my career, all of it from the beginning to the end when I was, you know, my last Olympics in 96, when I was 24, you know, one thing I will say is that there were always going to be t people telling you, you can't do things. Always. Yeah. So when I was, you know, 13, I was too skinny. When I was, you know, 18, I was not close to my world records. When I was 20, I was too old. When I was 24, I was over. Like people are always telling you there's a reason you can't do something. Mm -hmm. And so I, my, the lesson I learned most in the sport of swimming that I use every day is that you just can't listen to the critics yeah. because you have stay your course and believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing and what everyone else thinks doesn't, doesn't matter. And if yeah. you listen to it, if you listen to it too much, then you start to believe it. And then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And you and I both came from an era where like working hard and overcoming any of those, you know, for other people that think my might see as shortcomings, even though I don't think either of us thought of them really yeah. in that way. But, you know, we came from an era where we just train insane right just yeah. a lot of yardage high intensity but a lot of yardage um and we just grind so you know i don't know if i've ever asked you specifically for you i know we come from a similar training style but what did a typical day of training look like for you yeah so i was um 10 to 11 workouts a, a week um uh i started doubles i started i you know, i'd have to ask my mom but i started doubles i think in junior high, I think in eighth 
grade, maybe even seventh. Um, and then clearly, I think I was like two mornings a week. And then I got up to four mornings a week by high school. So I was, um, you know, 8,000 meters in the morning, 8,000 meters at night, um, usually doubles on Saturdays, Sunday off, um, did not do dry land um, till college. I never lifted a weight till college. And oh. I got to be honest, I, when I got to college, I bulked up and I think some of it was maturity and life and lifestyle and everything that comes with college. Um, but I think I attribute a little bit of it to the weightlifting. And, um, I personally, as a distance swimmer, um, I don't think I needed the weights and I know it's a huge, um, you know, philosophy, you know, philosophical thing. People have their differences. Um, and I am certainly by no means, uh, you know, uh, I'm opinionated about it, but everyone has to do what they want. But for me, weights yeah. are no, no, um, as they will be for my daughter as well. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Did you I, do I trained, I trained and trained and trained. I mean, I know Chloe, we've talked yeah. about this. I trained and trained and I have a log book and it's the workouts were insane. 2,400, yeah. you know, 5,000 main sets, you know, tons of pulling, very little kicking, just grind, <laughs> grind, 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 grind. Yeah. But I did a lot of speed work too. So in my, in my workouts, there was always speed work. Um, and even though I, grinded out the yards, there was always some kind of speed work to get me used to swimming fast. Cause I believe if you don't swim fast in workout, you can't swim fast in a meet. And so yeah. there was, there was speed in my, in my training as well. Yeah. I think that's a common misconception when you and I, or people like you and I, who did those pretty intensive, long yeah. training sessions that it was all just kind of easy swimming. Um, oh. but it's not, it's a lot of like speed play type stuff fast. And then, you know, active recovery between is a lot of it was a lot of mine. It's a lot of speed work. Totally. And by saying speed work, I don't mean 25s fast or 50s no. fast. I mean like 400 IM, like <laughs> then nine, 400 IMs descended one to three with, you know, third, three, six, and nine, you know, yeah. 15 off your best time kind of stuff. Like that, that to me was my kind of training. But you're right. It wasn't just swimming back and forth. I mean, I think that's like garbage yardage. There, there yeah. was intent in the, massive amounts of yardage and meters that I swam every day. There was intent. If you, if you train slow, your body learns how to just swim slow. And that's mm -hmm. not going to be racing. So. Right. Right. You can just swim. You can just swim back and forth, you know, but you need that. You need to get your heart rate up. You need to, you know, have some, some intensity in it as well. Yeah. So you didn't even do like body weight exercise dry land or did you do any of that at all? No not dry right. land. No okay. dry land. I just, I truly, you know, I, I did something that was akin to a VASA trainer, um, which is called the bench in my generation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so yes, I did that. So I guess there was that about 20 minutes a day. Um, but other than that, there was, you know, stretching and then in the pool. I mean, my generation, you know, I'm a generation before you too. So my generation was very set on yardage. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. you know, yardage, 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 more time in the pool, the better. Yeah. Yeah, because I did mostly body weight exercises. I never lifted heavy, and I think that yeah. that helped me. When I did weights, it was more like um, resistance or cables type yeah. stuff, yeah, um, or medicine balls. I never yeah. I didn't do much weights. And, and I think that differs based on, you know, like if you're a distance swimmer, you kind of need longer, leaner, you know, high rep, low weight kind of type stuff. If you're if you're a sprinter, you know, and you're you need some bulk to get through that fifty fast, like weights probably are a good idea. So I, I am by certainly by no means, you know, like condoning, you know, that you shouldn't lift weights. Like I, I just, I think it's a real personal thing and yeah. young, young people lifting weights to me always makes me a tiny bit nervous. Well, I find it so interesting because when you, you know, like you and I spend a lot of time around other Olympians, other Olympic swimmers, and um, everybody's got their own way that they did things. And Absolutely. You know, parents and kids ask all the time, you know, what's the secret recipe? You know, what should my kid be doing to be fast? You know, what should my kid be doing to go to the Olympics? And it's like, you know, you really got to figure that out. I can tell you my story, but that doesn't mean it, it might, it'll work for you, you know? 100%. And, and, and I also, I mean, as a parent of a swimmer um, who takes it very seriously and swims for my coach, by the way, um, you know, to me and my mom always told me this because my two brothers were good swimmers and they wanted nothing to do with it. They ended up playing water polo and then moving on. But, you know, I what I tell parents, Chloe, is 
you you're, you're you can want it, but your child has to want it. So unless your child wants it, it it's not going to happen. And so I, you know, at any level, at the collegiate level, at the Olympic level, at the junior national level, whatever, it it has to come from the from the child. And yeah. as you move up through the ranks, those athletes kind of tend to fall off. I mean, you know, people say that to me, the same thing, like, how do I get her to do this? Or how do I get him to do that? And I say, you can't, it has to come from them. If they don't want to get up and go to practice and they're not excited to go to practice, then you can't make them. And, you know, my parents were, you know, my dad was a vet and we kind of say like, he just talked to animals all day. Right. It was like the most mellow, chill guy. And my mom was a trigonometry teacher. So I don't know if you ever met my, my mom, but she is very like type a by the book. But so my parents were this very nice balance for me, but their rule was Janet, we will take you to work out. If you are at workout, you will do it right, right? You will do it right. We will make darn well ensure you will do it right. Because if we are basing our family vacations around you, if your brothers are home burning dinner while your dad's at, <laughs> at off, right? Like you, you will do this right. But if you don't want to do it, please tell us because we're not going to make you. And so exactly like my in, my, in my career, like, and my mom kept me a little bit on the straight and narrow, like, okay, mm -hmm. if you don't go to bed by now, you're not going to morning workout, right? So she was, she was my enforcer but she never made me. And I think when you speak to Olympians on our Olympic teams, I'd say 99% of them would tell you that. Like it, it was all me and my parents were my bumpers and my bodyguards and the people that got me to work out and where I needed to be. And they kept me in line, but they never made me. And I think at the end of the day, that is the true secret to um, success in, in athletics. And I, I, as a, you know, as my daughter swims, so I'm around a lot. My son plays little league. So I'm sure you guys all see that in the little league, but you know, um, it's important to me to, to, to teach that message for young people that, you know, we can't make our kids do what we want them to do in sport. It has to come from the kid and, um, yeah. you know, there has to be joy for them in it as well. Yeah. I always explain it. And my dynamic with my mom was I was always in the driver's seat. I was the right. one that was actually making everything move forward. I was the one that was choosing where to go. But my mom right. was in the passenger seat with the map and trying to right. navigate. And she was Absolutely. saying, oh, there's a light ahead. She was the one that was kind of making sure that I was <laughs> going the right direction. But it ultimately yeah. was all my decision. It was all me pressing the gas pedal or pressing the brake at any point. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And I, you know, I use the analogy that, you know, my dad, you know, my dad ended up being the one that took me to morning workout. And yeah, I didn't want to get up every morning. And my dad would say to me, don't, don't forget your goals. Right. And that would get me out of bed. But my dad wasn't standing over my bed being like, get up. Right. He was, they would give us those reminders. They would keep us focused because we were kids and you can lose focus. They, right. Cause they knew our goals, but they weren't making us swim. And I, I think that therein lies the difference and it is a fine line. Um, mm -hmm. but I think you learn your kid and you know what they're capable of and you know what they want and you kind of lead them in those directions as a parent. Right. right. So Karen, Orca, uh, she actually just asked me a really good question. So, you know, imagine if you and I were training in our, you know, right now, um, and there's such a push for kids right now to do so much dry land. Yeah. What do you think, I mean, what's your daughter doing? What would you have done during the quarantine to try to stay in somewhat of swimming shape? Because, you know, a lot of these kids aren't going to get back in the water until yeah. July or August. Um, and you can't just sit on your butt the whole time, you know? Right. No, you can't. And so for me, so my daughter did dry land. Um, she, the coach dropped off a VASA trainer and I love my the VASA trainer. I'm really sad we have to give it up because I've been on it. <laughs> <laughs> like reminds me of my olden days, right? But you know, in absence of that, you know, stretch cords, um, sit ups, medicine balls, any kind of dry land that is very movement oriented towards the sport of swimming. Personally, my daughter went out the other day and ran, and I was really mad at her because she came, she ran six miles and came back, <laughs> and I was like, what? And I kept calling her on her phone, but and she's like, my hips hurt, my knees hurt. A teammate of hers hurt her knees really badly running. Um, so I think for young people to all of a sudden start running um, 
was probably not like the best idea for my child. I know that. Um, but I think those core movements of swimming, obviously working on our core, um, the stretch cords are, are really important. So I, you know, to say that dry land, excuse me, wasn't important in my routine. I think now in the situation we find ourselves in, I think any movement that can mimic swimming um, and mimic what we do in the water is, is very important. So. Yeah. And, and Karen, okay. um, the one who asked the question, I would recommend if you weren't doing weights before, don't all of a sudden start doing yes. them, especially if, since you don't have real supervision to do them. I think, um, you know, I've been in, in all these webinars I've been doing, I've, and, you know, people ask what they should be doing right now. I'm like, just go play, go like, you know, be active, get out, you know, get, go, you know, play tag in the backyard or, um, but yeah, core exercises, yoga type exercises. Um, but yeah, don't do anything super brand new. Maybe don't run six miles yeah. randomly like Sydney, <laughs> but that's so Sydney, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So you had a very unique stroke technique too. Yes. Um, your famous windmill stroke. Yes. My stroke was very ugly. <laughs> it was not very pretty. And I had a very straight arm recovery and I, you can't really tell in the videos anymore cause they were so long ago. They're grainy. <laughs> so like, you know, like my swims are on VHS, um, which is so old school. So it's hard to tell, but my stroke was very rapid, straight arm recovery. Um, surprisingly never had shoulder problems, never once had shoulder problems in my career. I mean, I got, they got sore. I would ice them. Um, but I think a lot of that was the importance of warming up and warming down, which is a whole nother tangent we can go off on, um, and the lack of, of heavy weights. Um, but you know, what was great about my stroke was underwater. And so I always say to kids, um, when I do clinics, uh, it doesn't really matter what your stroke looks like above the water, because what matters is your yeah, that's what I say too. elbow, everything you do behind. And then, and so for me, because my stroke rate was so rapid, it just like, and the push, my push was so strong at the end of my stroke that it literally just made my, my arm straight. And, you know, I'll be honest with you at the end of distance races through my whole career, my wrists hurt, especially my right wrist. Cause I flicked it. Um, but my wrists would hurt after long races, um, or, or a really like long four or five days swim meet. Um, you know, my advice about coaches and, and people trying to change your stroke, you know, many coaches tried to change my stroke when I was a kid. I think a lot because it was a little bit embarrassing. Like I was just like, probably why Tiffany go on to me. It was like, oh, why? Like, who is that? I was like this wind up toy. Um, but you know, my first coach, my coach that took me to my first Olympics, my club coach, his name was Bud McAllister. Um, you know, Bud was the first coach that said to me, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So why yeah. it works why are we going to take all this time and try to change your stroke and maybe make it worse? It's working. doesn't matter what it looks like. Let's just get in the pool and, and make it work. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that everyone's strokes looks different and mine is the classic ugly stroke, but it got me where I needed to go. I don't think it's ugly, Janet. Thank you, Chloe. <laughs> it's Thank yeah. You. I mean, so yeah, like at my clinics, I always say, as long as your arm recovers and it moves, right, it recovers right. and it's not causing any kind of shoulder injury, then yeah. You're good. That's, so you, that's you never had any shoulder injuries, did you? Or did you? No, I didn't. I mean, look, by the time I got to college, I'd go in the training room at the end of workout and get, you know, some treatment or some ice or, but never, ever bad enough to, to warrant a trip to the orthopedic surgeon to have it looked at. Um, just typical inflammation periodic yeah. after long, after long training sessions, but nothing, nothing, um, you know, nothing bad. And, and I really truly attribute that to, I, always warmed up slow. Always. I always warmed down. Um, it kills me when I'm at my daughter's workout and the kids get out, um, when workouts over and you know, I, one thing I've been ingrained in her mind is you always warm down, especially after races, um, for so many reasons, but I was a big warm down person, um, and big stretching person before we got in and, um, just took really good care of, of them and never had, never had injuries. Thankfully. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. I think it blows a lot of people's minds that we put in the yardage that we did. Yeah, yeah. It's it's pre it's like, yeah, it's preventative. It's taking care of yourself. And like I said, that warm up, warm down process is so much more important than people give us credit for. And and we're always in such a hurry these days. You know, we got to get the kids out of the pool. We got to get them to home so they can do their homework and have dinner. But five minutes is is gonna pay off in spades as the years go by if they continue. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So Daniel Russell asked a good question too. Uh, did you do the fish burn set? Is that a set you ever did? Which uh, one is so I, I don't know if he's asking. I feel like I know it. Um, but have uh, I know the Viejo set. I don't know if Schubert maybe does it. It's uh, if I'm remembering right, the fish burn is five one hundreds, four two hundreds, three three hundreds, two four hundreds, and a five hundreds. Oh yeah, I did that all the time. And you start out, so say it was short course, right? So you do the five one hundreds on one oh five. Four two hundreds on two hundred five, the three hundred yeah. on three hundred five, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Daniel, I don't know what the background of the story of that is. I know, I feel like Coach Rose used to tell us at least. Um, which, for those of you who don't know, so my coach is Coach um, Bill Rose, and Bill Rose coaches at the Mission Viejo Natadores, which is now where Janet's daughter Sydney swims. For Coach Mark Schubert, who Mark Schubert was the coach that told me to go to Mission Viejo. Um, he really took me under his wing when I was about 12 and really starting to show promise. And he really helped guide me to where I needed to go. And that was while he was the head of USA Swimming. Schubert was also, he was your coach at USC. Yes. And, and Texas. Okay. Yeah. So you, you followed him. I did. Yeah. So Schubert I is said a that story. Yeah. So, yeah, but I want to go back to the fish. Room. Okay. Yeah. No, you're good. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so, I, yeah, I'm not sure, because Coach Rose and Coach Schubert have very similar coaching styles, very similar philosophies. Um, I'm sure they share notes a lot. I feel like the Fishburn set is something I did when I came back and did my comeback at 40. That's okay. when I remember it and being like, what is this? And then being like, oh, <laughs> oh, wow. And so yeah. I did do it, you know, but I will tell you that my training in the younger years was a lot like that. You know, it was like, you know, there's a set I see on Twitter that comes up every once in a while. And it was like four, 200 I am and an 800 free three, 200 I am 600 free two, 200 I am 400 free. Like something there's some Janet said yeah. or something. Yeah. So there was a lot of that in my training, which like we going back to our earlier conversation that those sets were the sets that allowed you to, you know, four, 200 aerobic 800 fast three 200s, you know, decently aerobic, 600 fast, right? And it allowed us to do that speed play within our longer sets. So, yeah. so yeah, that, that fish burn set to answer your question is, is very similar to the things that I did uh, my whole, my whole career. I just didn't, I think I'm going off topic here, but, and Chloe, you can tell me if you were the same, but like, I didn't get in the pool except for the 2400 IM set. And even those had like speed play in it and just do like five 800s. Right. Like there was always something in there to make it stepped or you know you know challenge me along the way or make it interesting as well i think that keeping workouts interesting is also very important i mean swimming five eight hundreds is just like ugh, who wants to just yeah. swim four thousand basically straight so yeah yeah i think we got off tangent there but yes it's all relevant and it's all good and yeah. this is i wanted this to be a good conversation of basically two people who have been in distance swimming you know for a while and um, in somewhat two different eras. And you also have the, the, um, the unique perspective now of being able to be a swim mom for a distance swimmer, for a young up and comer. Although um, she calls herself a breaststroker. Just she does. Oh, that's awesome. That's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, I'm pretty proud because I gave Sydney a couple of lessons and I was living in Southern California. Right. So I, I like follow. I follow her. Yeah, in a, part of it all, just, Chloe, for sure. Yeah. Totally. She loves you. She says hi, by the way. Oh, yay. Hi, Sydney. Um, so Karen asked another good question. Do you believe in, did you do many test sets where you had to like, yes. you know, swim? yeah, that was something that was a huge part of my training. It's like at least once a month, if not more often, some kind of test set. Um, she said, Karen, who, and Karen, I know I know you. I forget from where specifically. Um, but she said she's noticing that swimmers will not show up on test set days, which is oh, yeah. crazy because that was like the most important practice. Of course. Like, like I said, it goes back to the whole week. Like Friday is going to be test set day. Maybe even bring your racing suit, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it, at the Natadors now on Saturday mornings, they wear tech suits for, for oh, wow. uh, yeah. days. And um, I remember I dreaded test set days because I was always so scared, you know, yeah, like I was I nervous, nervous before out yeah. what the test that going to be but man they're important i mean that yeah. is gotta learn how to race 
Yes. You got to practice racing. Absolutely. You can't just practice swimming yeah. moderately fast. You can't even just practice swimming fast over those long sets. Yeah. You've got to practice racing. Those those make the difference. So maybe yeah. maybe Karen like surprise them. Don't tell them what day it is. <laughs> just like alternate all the days, you know? Like, oh wait, it's Tuesday test that day. Oh, next week yeah. it's right. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about racing a little bit. Um, did you get nervous before races? I did and I didn't. Um, I, I got nervous-ish, but for me, I always liken it to having done my homework. So, you know, to right. me, every workout was an opportunity to get better. Um, every missed workout was a missed opportunity to get better. And that came from me, not my parents. Um, and I, so by the time a big meet came around, I could look back on my training and know how I was going to swim, basically. I mean, clearly there's some, you know, question of whether you hit your taper, et cetera. And so, but, but I pretty much knew it meets where I was and how I had trained uh, during that season. Um, and so for me, I always say it's like, you know, you know, that when you do, when you, when you have a test, I would say it's a history test and you study and you study and you study and your best friend doesn't, and you guys get into the classroom and the teacher passes out the test and you're like, you flip through the pages and you go, oh my, this, yes, yes, I know this. I can't wait to answer it. And your best friend's like, what? Like, this is, this is so hard. This teacher is a jerk, whatever. Right. And that was what it was like racing for me. Like I had done my homework and the meat was the test. And so I, you know, for me, I always use the example of swimming against the East Germans for the first time in 88. You know, they had, you know, won almost every gold medal at the 76 games. They held almost every world record. You know, we boycotted 80, they boycotted 84. So the 88 games were our first real Olympics against them in over a decade. And they were very intimidating and they were very dominant in my sport. And they were, as we said, like, you know, like 80 pounds heavier than me, eight inches taller than me, and just big, strong, amazing girls with big track records behind them. And for me, I didn't let that bother me because to me, all I did was stand up on the blocks or sit behind the lane as they were announcing us and think about my training and think about where I was. And I didn't let them um, bother me because I can't help what they were doing in East Berlin. All I could help was what I was doing in Southern California. Um, and so that gave me peace and that gave me calm and that gave me like a sense of purpose when I went into my races. And so, yes, I was always nervous because you're in the moment, but I was never like horrified um, because for the most part, you know, I trained, I trained hard, I trained well. And by the time I got to a meet, I was always prepared. Yeah. Good. Um, so what kind of things did you think about before stepping up the blocks or, you know, maybe the last, you know, few hours before a race, what kind of things would you focus on? Would you focus on just thinking about your training? You're the type of person that really needed to focus on what your plan was. I did. Like I couldn't go in the ready room and I'm a really social person. I could not go in the ready room and like goof around with my friends. Right. I, I wasn't that girl that like bounced into the ready room was like, hi, let's tell a joke. Right. Um, I was more like Michael Phelps in that famous picture. Like I yeah. had Walkman. That's how old I am on. Um, and you know, I couldn't cause I, I like, I had to stay focused cause I get, could get distracted very easily. Um, and so I was like fully into my race and I was a big visualization person, huge visual visualization to me was half the battle. If you could see that you've already done it in your mind, you've already done it. And so, um, visualizing to me, was you know a process that began a few weeks outside of my big meet probably around the time we started our taper i'd begin to visualize my races lap by lap every day and so i would go through an entire 800 in my mind and so by the time i got to that 800 i'd already swum it 50 times in my brain so for me visualization was really important but i had to keep that focus and that's okay like if you yeah. need to go you know away from everyone before your race and leave the tent and be alone great as you should. If you need to be hanging out with your buddies until 10 minutes before your race, that's good too. It's no, not one size fits all. But for me, I needed to be non-distracted. But yeah. others, others want to be like talking all the time, but until you get up to the blocks, which was not me. Yeah. No, yeah. I was a talking person. You were? Uh, yeah. So oh, I, we wouldn't have gotten along then if we were. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we did not, we didn't have come out in the living room. Yeah. I, um, I get in my head and I overthink. And I do my visualization usually the night before. That's when I really 
do all of that. And then through warm up, I'm really visualizing. But it's like when I get out of the warm up pool and when I start actually getting into my racing mindset, if I continue to really overly focus on my race, it's like I, I, I exhaust myself, right. you know, overthink I it. overthink it. Yeah. And so my, Coach Rose always, his last piece of advice before I stepped up on the blocks was always just smile. And yeah. so that was always kind of how I went into the ready room was like, I need to smile. I need to like laugh a little bit. I need to race happy. And that's how I raced fastest. Yeah. But you know, everybody's has to have, who's like, I think Katie Ledecky's more of the, she was always more quiet in the ready room, had her headphones on, just focused, you know, and then yeah. and Allison Schmidt were the ones that kind of needed to like talk and almost be silly with each other in order to, I needed to get out of my own way. Basically I had done all the work and I knew, and I was confident in that. But my head would get in the way of that sometimes. Yeah, you know? yeah I get that. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. And everything's different. But you and I would have been like, okay, Chloe, leave me alone. And I would have let you be over there. Because, yeah, there's, there's all the different types, you know. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I forgot to ask this earlier, you know, because I want to ask what your mindset was through those long races, through like an 800 or a 1500. But also, like, what your mindset was during those long practices. Was it similar? And, like, you know, how did your – how did you get through those long races? You know, what would you think about? Cause there's a lot of time to think sometimes in those long races. You sure do. But I, I remained focused. Um, I always liked a good race too, you know, swimming alone is always worse. Um, but I remained focused for me. It was keeping my tempo. It was driving my tempo. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if I felt my tempo slowing, I, you know, have kind of a burst and I, for me, it was, it was that like, like a rower, like, or like a metronome on a piano, right? Like, tempo, tempo, tempo. So for me, I was completely focused on, on my race and my tempo and, and where my competitors were. How about you? What, what, did, what got you through it? Yeah, I was very intentional um, yeah. in both practice and in racing. I yeah. wanted to always wanted to know my splits and keep everything perfect. So coach Rose used to signal to me on the side of the pool, two hands up was on pace. One hand up was, we used to like talk beforehand. Okay. If I'm between this time and this time, two hands up, if I'm between this time and this time, one hand up. And if I'm over that both hands down. Right. And so he would usually try to find somewhere in the stands or somewhere where I could see him when I took a breath, when I took yeah. my first breath off of like every hundred. And, um, and I would like, you know, I would see where my pace was. And then I would like, really intentionally throughout that next hundred try to either maintain right. or increase you know so it's being very my goal was always to be very present and to be intentional and to never both in practice and a race let a lap go by without me getting something out of it right i i think that's really well said absolutely yeah yeah i think I that's a challenge for a lot of swimmers in today's age um you know our attention spans are getting shorter i know for me i i, I can't train like that anymore my attention yeah. span has gotten yeah. much shorter you know, it's true. And I think, um, you know, signals from coaches is very, very important. If that's what makes you do well, you know, Sid always tells me that coach Schubert, if you're off pace, he goes and he sits down. <laughs> and so he like gives up. Right. And she's always like, Oh, it's the worst when you're in the middle of the 800 and he sits down <laughs> and she, you know, and so, um, I don't know if that helps or if it doesn't, but I was very into signals and pacing and kind of understanding. Yeah. Now, I the, my favorite story is my one of my very best friends who um, we swam together our whole lives. We were at Pan Pax in Tokyo in 1989, and she was my roommate. She was my maid of honor. Um, her name was Julie Cooper, and she was a sprinter. And we were sitting in our room before finals of Pan Pax in 1989. And I said to her, here is what I am going to do in my 800 tonight. And I'm going to go in 816. And she goes, okay, whatever, Evans. That's what she called me. And I gave her a piece of paper and it had my splits to the tenths. Like, I don't even remember what they were like 1023, 1024, 1022. And she stood on the side of the pool with that piece of paper and I can still see her. And she was next to my coach who was signaling me. And when the race was over, every split was exactly what I said it was going to be. And she was, to this day, I remember she was like, that was, she was a hundred freestyler, right? She missed the 92 team by, she got seventh at trials. She was like, what, you know, she couldn't believe it, but it is the mindset of a distance swimmer. And it is kind of how we operate. And she still has that piece of paper. And that was my world record. I went in 816 and that's the one that stood I don't know, for a long time, <laughs> but that was how we, that's how distance swimmers I think operate. And I'm sure you did the exact same thing. Like these are my splits and this is where I'll be. And if I'm not there, you better be giving me two hands or one hand or no hands or sitting down on if you're Mark. So. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite games to play in practice. A lot of times since I didn't do high school, 
um, when I was training with Coach Rose, I did it all online. I did graduate high school. But uh, Jenna, actually, you and I have the same degree. I have my degree in uh, communications, too. It's so. a good degree, especially in this day. Communication is important. I always tell my husband, the finance major, that, right? <laughs> like, you do those communications majors every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one of my favorite games to play, you know, everybody would leave for school and I would stay in and do a few extra hundreds, basically. My coach would say, okay, I want you to go 105 two. And I'd try to hit a 105 two. Okay, now go 107 six. And I just try to be so precise with hitting whatever pace he called out. And then yeah. we played those games throughout the season and we would play those games in my races or he'd be like, okay, these are, I want you to hit these, these times and this time, this time. And it might not even be a best time, but if, you know, he knew I was in hard training or even if we did a, a workout the morning of a swim meet, he would say, these are the splits I want you to hold exactly. And my goal would to try to be that precise. And I think that's, that's a really interesting talent that a lot of distance swimmers have. It is. I agree. And you know, it's interesting when I, when I did swim again at 40, which was as a 40 year old woman was with children, it was very empowering in many ways. But the one thing that one of many things that I take from it is that it's amazing what your mind, what your mind allows your body to do. And, yeah. and so, you know, people would say at 40, it's impossible to swim at that level again, but my mind allowed my body to do it and my body responded. And so never underestimate the power of your mind and what your mind can teach your body and what your mind can get your body to be able to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, yeah. I believe that hundred percent. I used to really believe in, yeah, just. If you can, like you were saying, like if you can visualize it, if you really believe it, you know, you, your body will just follow. So yeah. did you have a strategy going into your races? I know you said you wrote, you'd write down like your splits or you try to hold yeah. splits. Did you like push a certain part of the race or was it all just go? I was out fast. It was all just go. It was out fast mm -hmm. and, um, hold, and I just never got tired really hold the pace the whole time. Um, you know, the one exception to that was in the, my 400 freestyle in Seoul, which, um, probably my favorite race to watch on that grading video, which I haven't watched it in years, but, um, you know, I, I was the, I was the world record holder 405, a woman named Heike Friedrich from East Germany had lost the race in many years, nor had I, um, it was kind of this grudge match. Heike had just won the 200 free the day before I had just won the 400 IM the day before, you know, it was kind of like the battle of the East versus the West. And my coach had said to me, you got to get out on her because the East Germans were kind of known for closing. And I wasn't, I was more known for being out and staying ahead. And, um, he said to me, if you're not, if you're not far enough ahead of her at the 200 and the 300, she'll pass you on the last hundred. And at the 200, she was even with me. We were both out in two Oh twos. And then at the 300, um, we were even, and, um, and then the 400, she, she faded. And I think she, if you watch the race on the grainy video, she puts her kick in, um, on the fifth and sixth lap. And I think it makes her really tired and she just didn't have it to end. And it was the only race I negative split and I loved it. It was so fun, negative splitting. Yeah. And I was never I able to do it again. Um, so I love that race because I have no idea how I negative split, but I had to, to win. Um, and, but, but that was the exception to my rule, which was out fast and hang on for dear life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you weren't, you didn't really kick much in your stroke, right? No, I was you a terrible kid. I, and I think that's one thing that swimming has really changed. Um, you know, I even noticed it during my comeback is the kicking is really important. And I agree with that. I think kicking is very important. It helps your endurance. It helps your speed. It's so important. And I completely agree with that. But like I said earlier, like we didn't kick a lot and my kicking, I had a strong two B kick and, you know, I don't think it would make it nowadays. I mean, you, you have to have at least a four beat in there. Um, I'm amazed at how much people kick in the races these days. Yeah, I two beated until I was getting ready for the 2012 Olympics and um, kind of noticed that people weren't two beating much anymore, yeah. you know, because I swam with Kate Ziegler for a long time. Yeah. And so she was kind of the stroke I started to, you know, just yeah. follow. Yeah. Um, and then I remember the day Coach Rose said to me, like, okay, if you want to swim the 400, and maybe even try for a 200, uh, you got a kick. And so you're not allowed to two beat ever again. Yeah. Not warm down, warm up, not warm down um, yeah. the entire thing. So um, yeah, I mean, and Katie Ledecky does sometimes a bit of a four beat. She mixes up her kick a little bit, but she does kick pretty significantly. Yeah. Um, if you guys watch some video, some grainy video, there's even grainy from 2008 Olympics. If you guys no, watch it's not, it's like digital. <laughs> <laughs> um, you years later. What it, you'll understand what a two beat kick is. Um, it's really, because Katie Ledecky doesn't do the, the almost leg dragging, more counterbalance than actual propulsion. Right. 
Um, yeah. It was really Mine was very counterbalanced. Yeah. yeah. Very counterbalanced. Um, so yeah, that's it's a it's a very uh, kind of old school style of freestyle that is extremely efficient. Now when I swim, when I just go swimming just to swim, that's how I swim. I don't kick when I yeah. swim. Yeah, we always go back to our roots, right, Chloe? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so did you have any major career disappointments or challenges that you had to like uh, get through? Oh yeah, I mean I would say that I had more disappointments than I had successes, but it's the disappointments that make the successes feel so good, and so. You know, I think um, a misconception amongst athletes like ourselves is that it's always easy. You know, I think young people look at us and they say, oh, yeah, well, you're an Olympian, so it was great for you the whole time. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's something that's very untrue. Um, you know, for me, my biggest challenge was understanding – this is a little bit of a long explanation, but for me it was really understanding that we're not always going to win. And, you know, I began my career winning, right? I mean, I broke world records at – 15. I went to my first Olympics. I turned 17 the week before the games. Um, you know, I was basically 16, you know, to me, it was all about winning. It was all about world records. It was all about, um, just, you know, my identity became wrapped up in, in Janet Evans being a winner. And I went to the 92 games. I, I was in college at the time. I was, you know, my body was different. I didn't like swimming quite as much. I hadn't trained quite as well. And I got out touched in the 400 freestyle by a former East German named Dagmar Hesse. And, um, you know, I won the silver medal in the 400. I hadn't lost the race in like seven years and I was a world record holder and it was very discouraging to me. And, and, and to me, you know, to win a silver medal at the Olympics, you know, I was Janet Evans. I was supposed to win all the time. Like, what do you, what do I do with a silver medal? Right. And, you know, I remember I, I called my parents from the village and my dad was like, Hey, Janet, you know, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Like your mom and I still love you. And you're, you know, you're going to go home to your family and it's just a swim meet. Right. And, and so for me, my perspective really was off kilter. Um, and so for me, I, I quit after the 92 games and, you know, I'd left, I had left Stanford after my sophomore year to go train with Mark at Texas in preparation for the 92 games. And I quit after 92 because I realized I needed to understand that life is going to have challenges and speed bumps and it's not always going to go your way. Even if you train your hardest, that you're going to have bad days. You're going to have bad weeks. You're going to have bad months. And that's just not in swimming. That's in life. And I didn't understand that. And so I came back to swimming in 92. I followed Mark to USC um, to really learn that, you know, swimming is a very small microcosm of life. And, and, and the things we learn are the things that are going to help us later. And that is, we're not going to win. We're not always going to be our best. We are going to have those bad days and, and how you deal with those bumps in the road and, um, those failures, if you see them as failures is what's going to kind of make you who you are as you progress through the rest of your life. And, you know, the lessons I learned between the 92 Olympics and the 96 Olympics when I was swimming for market USC was less about swimming. Well, and was more about becoming a person outside of the pool. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I met my husband who barely knows how to swim. I, you know, graduated from college. I have a, made a lot of friends that weren't swimmers. And so like, I just think I needed balance and perspective in my life. And, um, you know, I'd say I had some really hard years there. And I also think the pressure really gets to you, you know, the pressure yeah. of staying at this level, um, and this intensity. And that's one of the, you know, people clearly I work in the Olympic world now with the LA 28 games and, you know, clearly postponing Tokyo was something that I was asked about a lot. And, you know, for me on a personal level, it was just the intensity of these athletes. You have another year of this incredible intensity and pressure and performance and um, inner kind of hard work that they have to deal with. And so a lot of it is mental. Like, how do you get through that? How do you tell yourself it's okay if you're not, if you go a 408 in the 400 free instead of a 405, you know, how do you as an individual um, learn that at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's disappointing and we worked hard, but but like my dad said, the sun's still going to come out the next day. And so, yeah, I had a lot of hard times. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I think one thing that kind of got me through it was I generally, and I can't say always, generally tried to have a positive attitude. And yeah. I tried to show up and work out with a smile. I tried to be a good teammate. I tried to, you know, be positive to my teammates, even if I was struggling inside. And I, that's yeah. a long answer, but yes, I had a lot of hard times. I think for it's sure. so important for all swimmers to know because I, I remember, like, you know, my first Olympics talking to some of the other Olympians and being like, wait, you struggle? Like, I've had your picture yeah. on 
call and like even yeah. having yeah, yeah. you one time and I like was talking to you about some just insecurities and anxieties and I'm like wait you struggled too and it's yeah. like, of course and it's it's not only um something that we all experience but I think it's an important part of the process you know I think it's an important because if it was just easy it wouldn't be rewarding um I don't think any I don't think you you can get to a high level of anything without having a lot of struggle because it's it's just a necessary part of the growth absolutely you know? absolutely and that's why you know like I said like I agree and that that's you know goes back to what we're talking about with kids being in the sport like these are just lessons they're going to learn. And we, we as parents know that, right? Like that is something that I use every day. I use it in business. I use it at work. I, right. And so like these lessons I learned, I needed to learn in my early twenties because now they make me who I am today. Mm -hmm. And the struggle, I mean, it sounds very cliche and like should be on a poster on our wall or something. <laughs> the struggle is a part of the journey. Yeah, and It really is. And you can't um, not have bad days. Like you, you have to have bad days. You have to have bad swim meets. Like, mm -hmm. It's worrisome if you don't have bad swim meet. Like you're gonna have bad swim meets. It is what it is, right? But it's gonna be okay, right? And I think that's another whole thing that we could have another webinar about is like young people getting through the hard times because they're they will yeah. be there. And how do you stay motivated? How is a young woman, you know, when you reach that inevitable plateau, how do you get through that? And and yeah. a lot of it's a mental game and a lot of it's a confidence game. Yeah. And I think my biggest yeah. struggle, I think because there's always going to be ups and downs in the sport was realizing that the world was bigger than swimming. Yes. Cause really my world was swimming and it was so yeah. hard to imagine that there was anything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's important sometimes to have that perspective, but at the same time, you know, I also think in order to be great, you have to be pretty obsessed with it too. So right. Right. You know, balance the strike to like keep yeah. things in perspective, but also be super hyper motivated and focused. Um, yeah. And then, in, in, yeah, within there somewhere is just staying positive and, and always banking on yourself, always believing that, you know, yeah. if you work yeah. hard, good things will happen. Yeah. So on a lighter note, um, do you have a favorite memory of your, I know you probably have favorite memories with having kids and marriage and everything. Cause I know for <laughs> me, marriage and then like so far pregnancy has way out shined anything I experienced in swimming, right? There's so much joy, but, but what about in your swimming career? Did you have, um, a favorite moment or memory or something like that? Yeah. Um, first of all, I loved high school swimming. So, um, that just easy answer, <laughs> but, um, my greatest memory actually didn't happen in a pool. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, the, the years between 92 and 96 were especially, you know, uh, it was a steep learning curve for me. Those years struggled into 92, kind of came out of 92 under trying to figure out life as we just spent a long time talking about. So, you know, for me, it was kind of learning that the Olympics weren't always about winning. And so we were about six weeks outside of the games in Atlanta. And I had worked with the gentleman named Billy Payne, who was the chairman of the Atlanta games, um, on bringing the Olympics to Atlanta. He had become a, a very good friend of mine. Um, and we were training in Knoxville, um, the Olympic team, the U S team was there. We were moving down to Atlanta, um, in a week or two. And I got a call Mark pulled me out of the water and we were in the natatorium and I got this call and, and Mark said, get out of the pool, get out of the pool. Billy's on the phone. So Billy is like, you know, he was the man, right? He was the boss. He was it. And, and, um, kind of like when Billy called the world stopped. And so I get out of the pool I'm in the middle of my workout, which is very unmarked to let me get out. And I'm standing yeah. on the pool and he had been routed to me at the pool. And he says, Janet, what are you doing? You know, I said, well, I'm, I'm swimming clearly. I'm like in the middle of my workout, Billy, what do you need? And he said, well, I, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to run the torch at opening ceremonies. And I'm not going to tell you who's passing it to you. I'm not going to tell you who you're passing it to, but you'll be the second to last runner and the final woman. And I had carried the torch a few months before when it came to LA, because the Atlanta torch began at the 84 at the Coliseum here in LA. And, um, and so, uh, so I said, no, Billy, you know, I swim the next day. I don't run. I fall. I'm a swimmer. Um, I, I don't go to opening ceremonies. Like, no. And, you know, he went on and on and said it was going to be the greatest moment of my Olympic career. And I kind of said, yeah, 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 whatever. Like winning a gold medal is the greatest moment of an Olympic career. Anyhow, he convinced me to run the torch. Um, and so I couldn't tell anyone. So I got snuck out of the village that evening of opening ceremonies and um, ended up standing in the middle of this track. And as history tells you, you know, I ended up passing the torch to Muhammad Ali. And 
I remember running it and I remember it was my first opening ceremonies uh, as an athlete. And I remember running and looking at the infield and looking at all the athletes, mostly not swimmers, um, because you guys were all sleeping and resting. But I remember seeing like the gymnasts on the shoulders of the basketball players and the volleyball players and the water polo boys with their bleached hair. And um, I remember looking at those athletes and kind of seeing them for the first time because I was very unsocial in the village. I always wanted to just focus on swimming. And um, here I was at opening ceremonies, carrying the torch looking at these athletes and I kind of realized as I was running it and looking at these athletes that the majority of athletes at the games don't win medals. 90% of athletes who compete at the Olympics and the Paralympics come home without a medal, um, but they're there and they're representing their countries and their families and their friends and their dad that got them out of bed at four in the morning and their mom that made dinner while they were running or at the gym. And um, that was kind of what, what the Olympics were about and in a bigger picture, what being part of something is about. And so you know, and then to stand there with Ali, who you're way too young, and I am probably too young too, but learning about him and what he stood for and the courage it took for him to stand up there, you know, not being able to box as he was, but say to the world, I'm here and I'm present and I'm, I'm influencing and, and, and motivating people. Um, for me, it was a real epiphany and it, it transcended swimming for me. And I always say I'd give up every medal to do it again, but and it's funny, I just I just wrote a piece for the Ali Center last week um, talking about that moment um, because it was so transformative for me. And it truly is what kind of guides me in my in my daily life, which is, you know, you have to have courage. You have to work hard. Um, you have to be present you know, you have to find joy um, and you're part of a bigger picture. And winning is is amazing. And it's a part of of our success. But also the journey to that is is much more important. Um, and so that really was my transformative moment. And I always say I'd give up every medal to pass the torch to him again. It, it meant that much to me. Um, and I'm just so happy that I, that I did it. And um, that's it. So my, my transformative and most amazing moment certainly didn't happen in the pool. And I think that's telling because it's allowed me to kind of move on and, and be successful in other areas as well. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I yeah. I told Jake, my husband, about that this morning because I was like, okay, so the girl I'm interviewing today, and he was like, yeah, I know. We had a Christmas card on our fridge this winter, and he's like, she has two kids, you know, this and summer, lunch of gold medals. I was like, yeah, but I want to tell you something else about her because he, yeah. he has like a pristine memory. So I like tell him, and I have terrible memory, so I tell him over and over, like, I'm so excited yeah. to talk to Janet. And he's like, okay, I know. You've told me about this. Yeah. I'm like, no, I have to tell you something else about her. <laughs> And he was like, whoa, that's really cool. That was what I was telling him about this morning. So thank you. It was, you know, I will say that we, in our home, I have no swimming awards, nothing. Like you would walk in this house and you would never know that a, an Olympian lives here except my torch. So it's framed and in our den, um, the cool. torch that I use. And so, yeah, that's how meaningful it is to me. And our my kids know it's like, you know, very important part of, of what defines me now. So, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah. Um, I don't want to keep you much longer. Um, Go homeschool okay. and work. <laughs> yeah. Do, are you okay with answering like one or two questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. We'll just add, 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 do a couple of questions. Um, let's see. Um, were you friends with your competitors? Yeah. Yes and no. Um, yes and no. I tend to be more better friends with sprinters, <laughs> um, but I was a pretty competitive person. So it's funny. I'm, I remain friends with some of my international competitors as well. So, um, a couple of East Germans, which has been really lovely and fun. Um, and that's a whole nother story about the pressures that they were under. Um, so yeah, but not like great, great, great friends more, you know, my college teammates, uh, were important to me and my high school teammates, um, and my club mates. So, yeah. Yeah. Did you have a most embarrassing moment? Oh man, I have many. I don't, I have, I have so many, but, um, I don't know. I, I love the story of I got caught cheating at workout and Mark threw a water ball at me and hit me in the head and I kicked myself out of workout for like two days. So yeah, I love that story. Um, but yeah, a lot of embarrassing. I don't even, I can't think at the, in this short amount of time, but yes. Yeah. Okay. I, well, guys, I think we should start kind of wrapping it up. Um, you guys asked some great questions throughout that I kind of threw in there. So um, be sure to follow um, Janet on social media. Um, also, Janet, you have a book, right? Oh, I have a book, but it's not about me. It's just a training book. I wrote okay. it a long time ago. I don't even know if you can still get it. 
Maybe you can find it somewhere on Amazon. People are talking about it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old, the old like archived books or something like that. <laughs> Well, you guys follow Janet on social media. Also be sure to um, keep in touch with Fitter and Faster. Um, you can follow Fitter and Faster Swim Tour on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Um, keep an eye out for other upcoming webinars. We have one actually, I believe tomorrow with Carl Lewis. So that's gonna be really so cool. I am gonna tell you that I might have to join that. So as super quick, I know we all need to go, but Carl is one of my, I've worked with a lot of Olympians and Paralympians as Los Angeles bid on the 28 games. Yeah, He is, unbelievable, the most humble, kind, you know, my husband meets a lot of Olympians and Paralympians. And from the very beginning, 16 years ago, when Billy met, my husband's name is Billy. When Billy met Carl, Carl's always remembered his name, always asked about him. Carl Lewis is a class act. So I'm so yeah. excited you guys are having him tomorrow. And I think everyone should join because he is a fountain of wisdom and an amazing human being. I adore him. One yeah. of my favorites. Be cool. And, and a le an absolute legend. Yeah. Just, I still can't believe he's my friend. Like I'm still somewhat in awe of, of him. Um, but I think it's so cool that he's joining you guys. I absolutely, I dig it that he's on with you guys. Yeah. So. yeah. Us too. We're so excited. Yeah. So Janet, excited. I could literally probably talk to you for another <laughs> two or three hours. I feel like we've got, you know, somewhat similar kind of backgrounds and um, I just look up to you so much and, you, you know, I you guys cool. family. yeah. So, Give your kids a to me. Too. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So yeah. thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.